previously on the grand scheme, snatching Sinatra. Every baron had the other baron's back. So I said, Joe, I give you my sacred word of honor. And I wanted somebody big and tough, and his name was John Irwin. He saved my life diving. I'll tell you what, I'll pay you $100 a week and all the beer you can drink, and you just play along with me. The first attempt was in Phoenix, Arizona. So we practiced the script that I had on my business plan. The phone had John's fingerprints and my fingerprints on it. John used that as the reason that we had to cancel the kidnapping there. And it turned out that Frank Jr. had an apartment literally two blocks from Dean's house. So it was like too perfect. So that's why I kept thinking that God had to be blessing this thing. My girlfriend, Pam, she wanted to be involved in the kidnapping, and she was rolling in money. We thought we had an ironclad alibi. Everything worked out to the last minute. The trip through downtown Dallas had just about concluded when the three shots rang out from an assassin's rifle striking the president. So Kennedy being shot, and Oswald, and all the didn't deter you. You didn't say, you know what, let's not do this now. No, I was obsessed, obviously. At this point in our story, Barry Keenan has tried and failed to kidnap Frank Sinatra Jr. three times. His first attempt was derailed by fingerprints on a phone receiver, the second by a political assassination that sent shockwaves throughout the nation and the world, and the third was foiled by a nosy neighbor. He says, well, you better get out of here because I've called the cops. So we took off, and that was the L.A. attempt failed. Frank Sinatra Jr. was about to head to Europe for the next leg of his tour. Now, Barry had already talked John Irwin and Joe Amsler out of kidnap retirement after the assassination, but even if he was able to do it a second time, he didn't have the money to fly his motley crew across the pond. Now, even though he was convinced that God had blessed his plan of operation, Barry knew his debts were swelling, and his chance at redemption was shrinking by the day. I just wanted to get as far away from L.A. and failure as possible. So Barry drove out to the San Fernando Valley, to the small bungalow that he had rented as a safe house for the kidnapping. He sat alone in the empty house, clutching the binder where he'd written out the plan of operation, imagining how the story was supposed to go. He was picturing himself and his crew popping champagne corks, laughing and clinking glasses, counting out hundreds of thousands of dollars in ransom money before returning Junior unharmed to his family pictured himself handing Joe and John fat envelopes of cash. He and Pam would toss the rest of the money into the trunk of his Chevy Supersport. Then they'd swing by the office of his poor dad, drunk and destitute. They'd walk in to find him with his head on his desk, passed out in a sea of unpaid bills and an empty bottle of scotch at his elbow. Barry would nudge him awake and pass him an envelope of salvation. Then he and Pam would go see his mom and Barry would embrace her and proudly hand her a wad of cash enough to afford the best psychiatric care money could buy. Then Barry and Pam would head out for a night on the town. They'd buy round after round for everybody back of the Jolly Roger, where Barry first dreamed up this whole scheme. And in the morning, Barry would get to work investing the rest of the money in real estate. He'd plant the seeds of his second fortune, and before long, Barry would bloom once more. It was all right there in the plan of operation. I carried my little binder with me like a Linus blanket. But now it looked like none of that was going to happen. How did it all go so wrong? Barry tossed the binder onto the empty floor of the safe house and opened a bottle of whiskey. And just as he began to sink into a boozy haze of self-pity, Barry had an idea. I had a really good friend and former roommate who was in the securities business with me who had gotten a great job with Citibank in New York as their security analyst. Barry had a designated phone at the safe house that he had set up for the ransom call to Frank Sr. when the time came. But right now, he picked it up and dialed his friend Colin in New York. I called him to see if there was any jobs that he could find for me in the securities business in New York. So we had a nice chat, and as a follow-up to that, I sent him pictures of Pam and a letter describing our relationship and that she was a member of the Tridel sorority and what have you. I was trying to make a geographical change of, you know, going to New York, starting life anew, blah, blah, blah. Colin said he'd see what he could do, but no promises. So Barry hung up and he went back to his bottle. And he stared at that binder on the floor. He put so much time and energy into perfecting the damn thing. All that research at the library, all those practice runs, those can't-miss investments in the car wash and the apartment building. 
But the more Barry thought about it, the more he felt like the plan of operation wasn't the problem. I mean, how was he supposed to know that the president was going to be assassinated, for crying out loud? His pinball had just caught an extraordinarily bad bounce. This was still a good plan. It was foolproof. It'd be shame to let it go to waste. Was he really just going to leave it there laying on the floor of a cabin in the San Fernando Valley? No way, Barry thought, taking another pull from the bottle. I got a way better idea. I actually was going to call up Frank Sinatra Sr. and said, I was planning to kidnap your son, but instead I have an investment scenario that I'd like to come present to you. Barry decided he'd been going about this all wrong. After all, the whole kidnapping thing was just a ploy to get investment capital from Frank Sinatra Sr. But maybe there was a shortcut. I mean, why not go straight to the chairman of the board himself? Level with the guy, you know, tell him, look, hey, Frank, how'd you like to get in on the ground floor of a can't-miss real estate opportunity? Fine, I, yes, I did have a plan to terrorize your family and blackmail you because of your alleged mob ties, but never mind that. You're a savvy businessman, aren't you, Frank? Let's get rich together. Barry finished the last of his booze and he grabbed the binder off the floor. He dialed Reprise Records, that was Frank's label, and he started chatting up the secretary who answered the phone. He was gearing up to make his pitch when the secretary said something that changed his mind. So I found out that Frank Jr. was appearing in Lake Tahoe before going to Europe. Well, when Barry heard that, he thought, oh, hold on, wait a minute. I can't get my crew to Europe, but I sure as hell can get him to Lake Tahoe. So I got the information of where he's going to be staying and where he's going to be performing and so forth. Forget that whole legit investment angle. The plan of operation was back on. Barry hung up on the nice lady at Reprise, took a deep breath, and placed a call to Pam. And I wanted to do this kidnapping so I'd make the money on my own and not be living off of my girlfriend's money. But in order to do that, Barry was going to need just a little bit more of his girlfriend's money. And so Pam put in $2,500 for the trip up to Lake Tahoe. Now Barry was picturing a whole new scene in his mind. He and Pam as Bonnie and Clyde. But unfortunately, Pam had finals at UCLA, so she couldn't make the trip to Tahoe. So Barry made one more call. That's when I uh, conned Joe into going with me. I told him that let's go on a vacation. And our relationship during the last parts of the L.A. attempt had strained Joe's and my relationship. Mm -hmm. So I said, it'd be good to just have some fun. And while we're up there, Lake Tahoe was booming. You could get a job in the construction industry, and, and I could get a job as a salesman for these condo projects. And so he had no idea that Junior was up there, and I didn't tell him. Joe said yes, and before you know it, he and Barry were cruising up the coast in Barry's Chevy Supersport. We had a wonderful drive up there, and of course we were drinking all the time. And when we drove into State Line, which is on the South Lake Tahoe, there in the marquee was Frank Sinatra Jr. on the marquee at the Harris Casino. And Joe blew up, and I thought he was gonna pound me. And so I said, Joe, it's, it's okay, it's just a coincidence. But of course, it wasn't. I'm John Stamos, and this is The Grand Scheme, Snatching Sinatra. Chapter 4, The Pickup. Now, granted, Barry and Joe were pretty drunk by the time they got to their room at Harvey's Wagon Wheel Resort in Lake Tahoe. But it's hard to believe that Joe bought Barry's claim. Sure, Barry, it's just a coincidence that this boy's trip to Tahoe just happens to fall on the same weekend that Frank Sinatra Jr.'s in town. I mean, for one thing, it was just a few weeks after Barry and Joe had tried to kidnap Jr. in L.A. And even though Barry swore they weren't going to try it again, surely Joe noticed that Harvey's Wagon Wheel Resort was right across the parking lot from the casino where Jr. was performing. And if not, then surely Joe noticed that Barry checked in using a fake name, John Allen. And even if he missed that, surely, surely Joe must have noticed when they got to the room, Barry opened the suitcase, he had two guns, two wigs, and a fake mustache. And, you know, staged glasses and what have you. Barry wasn't exactly being subtle. But if Joe did notice that Barry was up to something, he didn't say a word. And Barry also knew that he was going to have to soft-pedal Joe to get him back on board with the plan of operation. So at first, Barry just stuck to the ruse. Just a couple buddies cruising around Lake Tahoe for the weekend. So the next day, we went around the whole lake applying for jobs. 
They spent a couple days in town, but after Joe went to bed, Barry would sit next to the window of their hotel room, staring across the parking lot through a set of binoculars. I would watch Junior come from the hotel next to Harris Casino, and I saw where his room was, where he was staying. I suppose there's one possible reason Joe might not have noticed Barry acting shady. When Joe and Barry weren't driving around looking for work, they were pretty busy hitting the casinos. Long story short, Joe and I took the rest of Pam's money and gambled it. We were drunk, and you never gamble when you're drunk, and it didn't take long for us to go completely broke. And we were literally down to six cents between the two of us. Now, this may sound reckless, but Barry says it was all part of the plan, a calculated bender. So we were broke once again, so we ended up being in a position of having to kidnap Frank Sinatra Jr. to get enough money to go back to L.A. So now it was Sunday, and Barry knew Joe never missed his football game. Joe was religious about watching football, so I let him watch his football game, and then I said, Joe, we gotta go pick up Junior tonight. We're out of money, we have to go. You son of a bitch, said Joe. How dumb do you think I am? Barry decided it wouldn't be prudent to answer that question. So instead, he tried to reason with Joe. He reminded him that they were completely broke. Clearly, he explained, scoring some cash by kidnapping the son of a celebrity was their only ticket out of Tahoe. He says, oh, I told you, I'm not ha- going to have anything to do with that. Of course, Barry figured Joe might say something like that, so Barry played his trump card. I gave Joe my sacred word of honor, the Baron's oath, the chief mantra, that every Baron had the other Baron's back. So I said, Joe, I give you my sacred word of honor that if I chicken out, I'll get you back to L.A. and everything's done with. And so on that condition, Joe agreed to go with me across the street, you know, waiting for the time that I would check it out. But Barry was ready to see this thing through. And as usual, he had thought of everything. I had gotten a wine box from a liquor store earlier in the day and filled it with pine cones so that I would have some reason to be on the Harrah's property in case a cop or somebody asked me what we were doing there. Barry figured it was the perfect excuse to be knocking on Frank Jr.'s door. Nothing to see here, officer, just a humble delivery man. As Joe reluctantly switched off the football game, Barry placed a call to Jr.'s hotel room. I called Jr.'s room and asked for some fictitious name just to make sure he was in the room. And he said, you got the wrong room, blah, blah, blah. Hang up. After several nights of staring out the window, tracking Junior's every move, several months of maniacal scheming and false starts, and a lifetime of bouncing back and forth between the push of his angels and the pull of his demons, Barry Keenan stood still for a moment. Snow had begun to fall in Lake Tahoe. And when Barry finally spoke, he wasn't sure if he was talking to Joe or to himself. I said, Joe, last chance, now or never. Barry grabbed the box of pine cones, and he and Joe walked across the parking lot. So we go up to the second floor, start walking down the aisle to Junior's hotel room, and Joe kept falling farther and farther behind, and he was about 20 feet from me when I got to Junior's door, and I was carrying the Manischewitz wine box with me. So as I raised my hand to knock on Junior's door, Joe said, no, Barry, no, Barry, because he thought I would have chickened out by then. And uh, he sort of fell against the building. Even though I was 20 feet away, he was under a nightlight from one of the rooms. And uh, he looked like he turned snow white. And he was in a state of shock. But I, I knocked on the door. And Junior said, come on in. And with that, there was no turning back. All right, there's a term for going above and beyond for your pet. It's called having a pet. No cat or dog parent can resist the opportunity to pour on the TLC. 
And for my wife and I, we spoil our little rescue Lilo with Nom Nom. Now, Nom Nom is a pet health company that makes fresh, restaurant-quality food for dogs and cats. Every meal gets prepped just days before it ships and arrives fresh and comes perfectly portioned for your pet's dietary needs. Now, like I said, we've been trying out Nom Nom for Lilo, who's uh, recovering from cancer, and she's doing great. And by trying out, I mean we give it to her, and then I accidentally eat some uh, late at night when I'm looking for a snack. No more midnight snacks for me. But you know what? It's fine because Nom Nom stands by the belief that what's good for people is good for pets too. That's why their recipes are formulated by board-certified veterinarian nutritionists using only restaurant-quality ingredients. Nom Nom is super convenient. You just open the pack, you pour, and you serve. There's no scooping, no glopping, no goop, no worries about overfeeding or underfeeding. Nom Nom is obsessed with every step of the process. I mean, they are obsessed. They prep, mix, and they pack every delivery with care in their own facilities. Now, you just tell Nom Nom a little bit about your pet, and they'll create a meal plan based on your pet's age, breed, weight, and health needs. Not a calorie more or a calorie less. They know your pet almost as well as you do. Switch to the fresh pet food endorsed by Science Taste Buds and Lilo herself. Try Nom Nom today, and you'll get 50% off a two-week trial. Go to trynom.com slash Sinatra. That's T-R-Y-N-O-M dot com slash S-I-N-A-T-R-A for 50% off a two-week trial. Check it out. All right, this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp, I, I love this. This is really great. Look, BetterHelp will assess your needs, and they'll match you with your own licensed professional therapist. It's not a crisis line. It's not a self-help line or anything. It's professional therapy done securely online. Now, I think in the past there was a cultural stigma surrounding therapy that, that if you went to a shrink, you were crazy or something. Well, guess what? They couldn't be further from the truth. Therapy personally has helped me in every aspect of my life, relationships, career, parenthood. And BetterHelp, it's so easy and it's so private. You can literally start communicating in under 48 hours. Right? You can log on to your account anytime, and you can send a message to your therapist, and you'll get timely, thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, so you won't ever have to sit in that uncomfortable waiting room you know, that you have to in traditional therapy. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. So visit BetterHelp.com slash Sinatra. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Sinatra, and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional therapists in all 50 states. Now, this is a special offer for you grand schemers today, okay? Get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash Sinatra. BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Sinatra. All right, look. Up to this point, this story has been improbable, sure. But in my mind, it's also been at least sort of relatable, right? I mean, up till now, a lot of the action of this thing has been taking place in Barry's mind. And, you know, look, we've all had wild ideas, flights of fancy. Fantasies we play out a little further than we should. But this is the part of the story where things start to get weird. And Barry knew that. And in fact, as usual, he had a plan for it. I have gone to a director's chair. I'm looking down on the scene as if uh, it was filming a movie. I was looking down on it as if it was happening to somebody else. Here we go, everybody. Buckle up. Now, when Junior opened his hotel room door, he found Barry standing there holding a wine box. And Junior says, oh, good, you're here. Barry's head starts spinning. Oh, good, you're here. What does that mean? Who does he think I am? But before Barry could think of a reply, Junior waved him inside. And he was expecting room service, actually. So I came in, and I said, I have a package for Frank Sinatra Jr. And so we could put it right over there on the table. There he was, in the flesh, Frank Sinatra Jr. As Barry stood there with his wine box, which we all know was actually full of pine cones, he realized that Jr. wasn't alone. One of his bandmates, a guy named John Foss, was sitting at a card table with a couple of room service trays on it. They were both wearing T-shirts and boxers, getting ready to put their tuxes on for the show. Barry nodded and smiled and set his box down next to a lamp near the door. And then he slowly turned around, blocking the hotel room door with his body. And I reached in my coat pocket to pull out the gun, but the hammer got stuck on my coat pocket. But Barry kept his cool. I said, okay, this is a robbery. Where's your wallet? And he says, it's over there on the dresser table. 
And by that time, Joe had come into the room. I said, Joe, get the money. And of course, we had fictitious names, but I forgot the name. <laughs> and so I called him by his real name. But in any event, Joe got the money, and Junior had a $100 bill in his wallet. And Joe showed me the $100, like, OK, let's go. He says, we got the money. And he says that out loud. I said, no, we're not leaving. At this point, Barry finally got the gun out of his pocket, and he started waving it around. I say, don't move, nobody will get hurt. Don't move, nobody will get hurt. Like a stuck record. Everybody froze. And after a moment, Barry realized that everybody, including Joe, was waiting for him to tell them what to do next. I felt like I was kidnapping three people, because I had John Foss, the trumpet player, Junior, and Joe. You didn't trust that he was? Well, I, I, the only reason I was pointing the gun at him was sort of a, as a direction. I wasn't like threatening him to shoot him. I would never shoot Joe. I wouldn't shoot anybody. But um, I was trying to act tough to frighten Junior into cooperating. But Barry was flummoxed. He hadn't counted on the other guy from Junior's band being in the room. So he pointed his gun at John Foss and he yelled at him. I said, you get over on the floor and uh, don't look at us. Foss hit the deck. And as he lay down on the ground with his face buried in the carpet, he was probably wondering how he ended up in this situation. I mean, this wasn't exactly what he envisioned when he stopped by Junior's hotel room for a burger. Barry found some tape and started tying Foss's hands behind his back, but very politely. I asked Foss if he needed to blow his nose or anything because I was going to tape his mouth so he couldn't yell. And he was fine. And I put a pillow down so he would be comfortable. Barry made sure Foss was comfortable at least as comfortable as he could be with tape over his mouth and somebody with a box of pine cones waving a gun around. Barry turned to Joe. I said, Joe, take Frank, take this gentleman down to the car. And then I joined him, and as soon as I got in the car, I realized I'd forgotten my gun. Barry hesitated for a moment. He wasn't actually planning on using the gun, but it was an important prop. Because I had said, you know, there's going to be shooting if we get involved with cops. And of course, it was a complete bluff because one of the rules that God had given me, there can't be any violence, nobody can get hurt. But it was part of the script that I had in my little binder. So Barry got back out of his car and he hustled back upstairs to the hotel room where he discovered that John Foss was not following instructions. I come back up to the room and he's already up and is getting his, uh, I had, adhesive taped his arms behind his back and he was working on getting that undone. And uh, he dove down on the back, down on the floor when I came back in the room. Now, I'm really glad Barry said that thing about pretending he was in a movie earlier. Because if this really was a movie or maybe just a different kind of true crime podcast, this is the part where something horrific would happen. I mean, think about Fargo, right? Steve Buscemi tries to plan a nice, clean caper where nobody gets hurt. And then there's this minor snag when a cop pulls him over. His partner panics, shoots the cop, and everything spirals out of control. All right, so think about this moment in our story, right? Barry gets back to the hotel room, and he sees that Foss is about to escape. Barry's forgotten his fake mustache, and he's used Joe's real name. I mean, Foss could very easily make Barry's life miserable at this point. And now Barry's got his gun back. So as Barry was telling me the story, this is the part where I was expecting the tragic twist. Barry shoots John Foss. But this isn't Fargo. It's Barry. The same guy who put a pillow down for Foss before he tied him up. The same Barry who's convinced himself that this isn't a crime, it's just a sincere attempt to return to the state of grace. To help fix junior and senior strain relationship. Do right by his own father. And satisfy the committee, who, don't forget, Barry had promised that no one would get hurt. So instead of pulling the trigger, Barry asked Foss to do him a solid. I said to Foss, okay, now give us five minutes before you call the office and report this to the police, and we're going to drop your friend off 10 minutes down the road. But Barry couldn't quite make out Foss's reply. He was actually, I had taped his mouth, so he, he was grunting. Mm -hmm, mm -mm. Barry decided to take that as a yes. And so then I left with the blind box, and we had Junior in the car. Barry jumped in the driver's seat, and they took off. 
Now, when I say that, you're probably imagining them fishtailing out of the parking lot, tires squealing, maybe sideswiping a dumpster on their way out, but that's not quite what happened. See, by now it was snowing really hard, and Barry could barely see out the windshield. So it would be more accurate to say that Barry gripped the steering wheel with his two hands, he leaned forward over the dashboard so he could see in front of the hood, gingerly pressed on the gas pedal and began slowly creeping forward. It's what you might call a classic low-speed getaway. Now Barry's mind, on the other hand, was racing. The head start Barry was counting on had quickly been cut down to almost nothing. And I now realize that Foss, the trumpet player is gonna get loose in a matter of five, 10 minutes, and it's gonna call the police. There's probably gonna be roadblocks, and they're gonna be looking for three guys in a car. For a split second, Barry panicked. There was no way out. Maybe they should just quit while they're ahead and hope for the best. After all, they had a hundred bucks from Junior. That was more than enough gas money to get back to LA. So I thought, well, we'll let Junior off someplace where he could walk to get help. But it was about 22 degrees outside, so I didn't want Junior to freeze to death. But then, Frank Sinatra Jr. did something Barry wasn't expecting. I was just about to pull into Zephyr Cove Resort, which was closed for the winter. And uh, Junior pipes up and says, you know, you guys got guts. Junior was employing a classic kidnappy survival tactic. Cooperate, ingratiate, and develop a rapport. But as far as Barry was concerned, this was a sign. So at that point, my brain sort of magically cleared. I said, well, we So we're driving along, and now it's starting to snow heavily. At long last, Barry Keenan's plan of operation was finally working, and Barry didn't want to take any chances. I had given Frank two sleeping pills and a couple swigs of whiskey to make him drowsy and be like he was partying and all that stuff. And so by now, the, the sleeping pills were starting to take hold, and he was a little bit slurred in his speech and what have you. And just 10 minutes earlier, Barry had flirted with the idea of abandoning the whole thing, dropping Junior off in the parking lot of Zephyr Cove and fleeing with Junior's $100 bill. But that was before he discovered how accommodating Junior was as a kidnappy. Junior handed me his signet ring, which had the initials FS on it. He said, you better hold on to this because some sharp-eyed cop might see that and put it together. Now, Barry could have sworn that he'd planned for everything, but he hadn't thought of that. He took the ring and he slipped it into his pocket and Junior lay down quietly in the back seat. Barry turned his attention back to the road. He peered through the windshield into a blinding haze of snow. He had chains on the wheels of the car, so even though they'd picked up their bounty, this wasn't the clean getaway Barry had planned for. But the blizzard was the least of his worries. I was anticipating from the research that I had done that, you know, they would set up roadblocks as soon as possible. Barry figured Foss would have called the cops by now and they'd be looking for three people, two kidnappers and Frank Sinatra Jr. So Barry needed there to be only two people in the car. And we come around a sweeping turn and there's a roadblock. Red police car lights and flashing lights and what have you. So it occurred to me that uh, I could pretend like I was taking off my chains. So I said, Frank, you gotta pretend like you're asleep. And Joe, you run down the side of this hill until we see what happens when the police come up and see what we're doing. Now, if at any point you found yourself wondering how seriously Joe Amsler took the Baron's oath, well, here's the moment where you get your answer. I mean, think about this, all right? It's 22 degrees, snowing so hard you could barely see. And Barry's just told Joe that they might run into a swarm of cops at any moment, cops that are on the lookout for suspicious characters. And what does Barry ask Joe to do? jump out of the car and run down the hill. 
and he would get back to L.A. that way. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm Joe in this moment, I look at Barry and say, you've got to be kidding me. But that's not what Joe Amsler did. Barry pulled over, and Joe jumped out of the car and started running off into the snow. So I said, Joe, I'll see you later. Good luck. Now that's a Baron. Meanwhile, Barry busied himself with the tire chains. I start taking the chains off of my tire, and uh, the cop car comes up, hangs a big Huey, and comes up alongside of my car, and uh, the driver jumps out, has a shotgun on me, and the passenger cop looks in the car with a flashlight, and I'm just waiting for Junior to say, I'm Frank Sinatra Junior, I've just been kidnapped, but nothing. I said, what happened, officer? Is there some problems? And he said, we're looking, did you see anybody pulled over back up the road toward the uh, lake? And I said, no, it's hardly any traffic out. And he says, okay, well, be safe and good luck on your drive south. And I said, yes, sir. And with that, the cops drove off. Barry checked the back seat. Junior was still laying under the blanket pretending to be asleep. All clear. Barry jumped back in the driver's seat. But just as he was about to pull back onto the road, he noticed a figure coming toward the car. Barry hesitated. He could tell it wasn't a cop. The figure was staggering. And as it got closer, Barry could see that it had blood all over its face. The figure made it to the car and yanked the passenger door open. It was Joe Amsler. Joe, in his panic, started going down the steep embankment and ran smack into a telephone pole and knocked himself out cold. Joe was in rough shape. Blood was pouring from the cuts on his head. So much for nobody getting hurt. Joe was okay, but, you know, had been seriously hurt with this. I don't think he had a concussion, but he looked like he, he, he looked pretty bad. But Barry didn't have time to worry about that right now. He was certain that the cops must have seen Joe stumble out of the dark and get into the car. And there were only supposed to be two of them heading south, just a couple of guys trying to get to work on Monday. Barry grimaced and told Joe to get back out of the car. And I said, Joe, they know there's only two of us, so you have to get in the trunk. So I put Joe in the trunk, and I saw this big gash in his head, and so I pulled out my handkerchief, and I said, put this over your head until we can do some first aid later on. And so I closed the trunk. With the tire chains and his badly wounded accomplice stowed away in the trunk, Barry got back in the driver's seat and he kept going. Before long, he found himself approaching another police roadblock, but he wasn't worried. He could see the same cops that he'd just talked to milling around and figured they'd already decided he wasn't a suspect. So the cops were waving me through. But just as Barry was about to pass through the checkpoint, a different cop appeared out of nowhere. Hey! Sergeant Sandman, who had a chrome-plated shotgun, I'll never forget that gun. And um, he said, stop that X car or I'll blast you right out of it. And uh, he immediately put the gun on the windowsill and it looked like I was looking at two cannons, the double-barrel shotgun. And uh, I said, we've already been searched. And he said, well, we're going to search you again. I thought, oh, my God, as soon as they opened the trunk. And I was concerned immediately that they might open fire on Joe. And uh, the other officer on, that had come up and shown the flashlight in there said, these guys are OK, Sergeant. And uh, he said, OK, well, from now on, son, when you come to roadblock, you better stop or you're going to get shot. And I said, yes, sir. I understand. I will be very careful about that. So he said, get the hell out of here. So Barry got the hell out of there at 15 miles an hour. So after crawling through the snow for another few minutes, he finally merged onto the highway. For the first time in the last hour, Barry felt his shoulders drop, and he took a pull from the bottle of whiskey that he fed Junior. So we're driving along, and I'd sort of forgotten about Joe being in the trunk. And Frank pipes up, he says, I don't mean to tell you what to do, but uh, it's very cold outside and your friend's probably freezing in the trunk. And I said, oh yes, thank you. Barry pulled over to the side of the highway. And as he got out of the car, he could see a fleet of cop cars streaming in the opposite direction. 
headed towards Lake Tahoe. Barry took a deep breath and he walked back to the trunk. When he popped it open, a shivering, bleeding Joe Amsler rolled over and he crawled out. Barry knew the committee wasn't gonna be happy about Joe's injuries, but there wasn't time to worry about that right now. So he helped Joe into the passenger seat and he wrapped him in a blanket. And this time he was really frozen. So he got back in the car and 10 minutes farther down the road, I saw Joe staring at his feet. And I said, what's going on? And he says, I, now I know why my shoes were so uncomfortable. I put them on the wrong feet. It, it looked like he had clown shoes on. And so we described the situation to Junior and he laughed. And we all had a chuckle over that. Barry figured if Joe was laughing, that must mean that he wasn't hurt too bad, right? So technically, Barry hadn't broken any of God's rules. He stepped on the gas. And we proceeded on down the road. And so we turned on the radio. We interrupt your regularly scheduled program. And all of a sudden, the radio program is interrupted with a bulletin that Frank Sinatra Jr. has been kidnapped at gunpoint from his hotel room in Lake Tahoe. When he heard that, Barry glanced nervously into the back seat. Junior was just staring out the window, watching the snow stream by. And um, he said, once again, I'll play along. You don't have to worry about me. And I said, OK, great. Barry took another pull from the whiskey bottle and he passed it to Joe. They had 500 miles to cover in order to make it to the safe house by dawn. But now, since they have made it through the final roadblock, real or imagined, Barry wasn't worried. No, I was going for it. Because now I have my angels with me. Next on the grand scheme, snatching Sinatra. We turned the radio on in the car and they just started playing Strangers in the Night. I thought, wow, how amazing is that? Here we are, three strangers. We were all drinking. And it became like three guys on a road trip. Hear it next week for free wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also binge the entire series right now, early and ad-free, by subscribing to Wondery Plus. Otherwise, I'll see you next week. The Grand Scheme, Snatching Sinatra, is based on a true story as recollected and retold by my friend Barry Keenan. Certain names and details have been changed to protect the identity of those involved. The show is produced by Wondery in partnership with Spoke Media. Written by Sam Dingman and produced by Jenna Burnett with Lucy Wong and Kristen Bennett. Research and dramaturgy by Haley Nelson. Alicia Force is our coordinating producer. Our executive producers are Jean-Yel Kastner, Patrick Couday, Aliyah Tavakolian, and Keith Reynolds. Sound design and mix by NPAL Audio. Original music by Mike Bennett, Michael Gigante, and Matt Beckley. Additional music from First Com and Epidemic Sound. Special thanks to Will Short, Evan Arnett, Carson McCain, Caroline Hamilton, Kelly Kolf, and of course, the one and only Barry Keenan. I'm John Stamos. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.